We are going to continue our open Bible study format last Friday of every month. I'm answering your questions on anything related to God's Word, anything addressed in the Scriptures, and um, using your questions as our launching out point to go deeper in our own study of the Scriptures. And um, my goal is to, I, I really would prefer, on average, to address a couple or even possibly three questions per week uh, when we do this open study, but it's not always possible to do that just depending upon the nature of the specific question. Some of these questions require, if I'm going to answer them thoroughly, if I'm going to answer them with all of the information that I think is important to uh, bring to bear on that question, sometimes I will take one whole night to do one single night. Um, the question that I'm um, going to be addressing tonight is one that has been asked of me over the years many, many different times. And um, it comes up periodically. Usually it comes up, in, and as you'll see as I tell you the question, it comes up in a specific set of circumstances. But um, it's one in which it's not, this isn't uh, the most important question that we'll ever address or ever answer in our study of God's Word, but I want you to understand right up front, it's not unimportant either. And while uh, this particular question may not be particularly, specifically pertinent to you and your life circumstances right at this particular moment, doesn't mean it's not something that you don't need to learn about and grow in your understanding of, because this touches a principle that is very near to the core of our Christian life and of our relationship with the Lord. The question is this, what does the Bible teach about the subject of burial versus cremation? So what about burial and cremation? Well, This is a, a very personal topic, obviously, and it, it's somewhat of an emotional topic for many people because it touches personal circumstances, not just in terms of things that are going on right now or things in our immediate future, but in, in most of our cases, it, it touches at least some circumstance that we've encountered before, and many of us in our own family circle. And so, um, you know, it, I want to handle this question in answering it. I want to handle it in a delicate way. I want to handle it in a, in a right way. But at the same time, I want to be clear with you that the Bible does have a very, a very uh, important um, thing that it, it has to say about this particular topic. It's not, I don't think that there, this is one of those topics that, well, we're just not sure what the Bible has to teach about this. This is, I'll give you my ideas, I'll give you my thoughts, but it's kind of like an open-ended uncertainty. I don't think that's the case on this particular topic at all. I think the Bible is very specific and very clear about this. And the, the, the issue is this, simply, or the, the bottom line answer is that the Bible teaches the pattern and practice of burial. It does not teach the practice and pattern of cremation as it pertains, of course, to the disposition of the physical body once a person has died. And um, I would say in terms of the biblical pattern of how the scriptures address this issue, it's not, it's not even close in terms of a comparison between these two issues. 100% of the Bible's teaching is in favor of burial and 0% is in favor of the pattern and the practice of cremation. And so my goal in talking to you is to convince you of that to help you to see clearly through the scriptures what God has to say about this issue, okay? And for you to draw a biblical conclusion and a wise conclusion, and not just for your own personal and own family circumstances, but also to equip you to help anyone that you may encounter that um, has to make this kind of decision in their lives or in their family circle themselves. So the first question, let me, let me ask some questions related to this issue and then we'll use these questions to get started toward answering the biggest issue here, which is, you know, what does the Bible actually say about this? The first thing is this. What, what does it really matter? 
uh, does it really matter whether when someone dies, and, and let's talk specifically tonight in terms of the example of a believer. When a believer dies, they come to the end of their life in this world, and they breathe their last breath, and they have now died. What, what happens to the person that is the believer at the moment that they breathe their last breath? They, their soul leaves their physical body, and the Lord takes their soul and brings them directly into his presence in heaven. And they live with the Lord in heaven. Their soul is there with the Lord in heaven until the end of history as we know it, the second coming of Christ, in which their soul will return with the Lord to this earth to be reunited to the physical body that they once had, but a new and greater expression of that physical body in the great day that we identify theologically as the, the day of resurrection, the great resurrection. That's the truth about what happens to a believer the moment they die in this world. So if their soul, here's a believer, and they drop over dead. Their life is now at an end. And if their soul immediately leaves their body and is carried by the Lord into his presence in heaven, then really, what does it matter what happens to their physical body? Because they're not in it any longer. They're not with it any longer. They're with the Lord. They're in a perfected circumstance in heaven. They're blessed beyond measure. They're happy beyond measure. What does it really matter? Or does it really matter what is done with their physical body to dispose of that body for those who are left behind here in this world? Does it matter? The answer is yes, not just probably, not maybe. Yes, definitively it matters what's done with the body. And we're going to look at scriptures tonight that identify that it does matter. Second question is this. Is it a sin, since the Bible teaches, I'm saying, we haven't looked at the passages yet, but we will, since I'm saying that the Bible teaches against cremation and for burial, is it a sin to cremate? The answer is no. There's no place in the Bible that I see. There's not a single verse anywhere that leads me to the conclusion that it's a sin to cremate. However, there's a lot of things that I, I am instructed in God's word not to practice, even though they're not sin. Right? Now, I know I'm supposed to avoid sin. And you know that also. But there are other things, other practices in our lives that are available to us that we should choose not to practice, even if they're not overtly sinful, just because there is a better option. There is a better way to do what we're supposed to do in our life. And so in a case where the Lord gives us on any particular issue, any question, a clear cut distinction between one way that he says, this is the pattern I want you to follow. And this is the pattern that I don't want you to follow. It's always wise. It's always good. It's always healthy to follow the Lord's patterns, even if he never specifically identifies it as overtly sinful. So even though I would not say it's a sin to practice cremation, I would encourage you not to practice it because the Bible encourages you not to practice it and, and gives us many examples, as we'll look at a few tonight, of uh, why it's not a good and healthy thing in terms of a proper way to dispose of the physical body at the point of death. Okay, next question. Does creation, cremation, if it is practiced in any particular case, does it create a permanent problem for the person that's been cremated? Meaning, let's say uh, I'm close to you, you're in my family, you die. I don't really know any better. I've never heard this teaching before. And I, I'm, I'm responsible for disposing of your body, taking care of that particular issue and I choose to have you cremated, have I just locked you in to some kind of eternal problem because I burned your body up? No, I haven't. Now, 
I haven't done you any spiritual favors by cremating you. I haven't honored you in the way that God would have me to honor you. But I haven't created a problem for God in that it's not an issue because there are many physical bodies that have been burned up in the course of human history that God will have to miraculously reconstruct from the ground up, so to speak, on the day of the great resurrection. And so that's not going to be an issue for God. It's not a matter of those who are cremated. You know, we've, we've shoved their circumstance too far into the red zone. And as a result, you know, there, there's going to be some uh, problem with their resurrection because their body was cremated here in this world. That's not going to be an issue. Last question in our introductory questions is, is there any specific verse anywhere in the Bible that just, that I can lead you directly to one single verse that just says flat out, don't cremate, instead bury, so that you can have a nice, neat little package like that on this particular issue. And I would say, no, there is no single verse like that. There is no verse that says you must bury And there is no single verse that says you must not cremate. And if you do so, you know, you are sinning or you are violating the Lord's ways or you are disobeying the Lord. And because there's no single verse on this, there is there is some room within this the the consideration of this issue for good hearted Christians to look at this issue and draw different conclusions. But I'm going to encourage you to see What I've seen in this issue, which is that there's one right and proper perspective to reach at the end of our consideration, and that the lack of a specific verse that says in very clear words, bury, don't cremate, the lack of a verse like that doesn't leave us unequipped on how to answer this question, how to think about this question. We are given actually a bunch of of information by the Lord on this subject. We're going to go through just a portion of that tonight. I'm going to take you through, if we have time, about 20 verses of Scripture that address this issue from different perspectives. And I think by the end of going through these passages, it will be clear to you what the Lord wants us to think about this. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be extracting principles from these passages There are some issues in which the Lord leads us to a wise understanding through a consideration of examples, for instance, in his word, of how he worked in the lives of both those who were in right relationship with him and those who were not in right relationship with him, and how the differences between the stories that we see unfolding in their life situation are meant by the Lord to teach us the right way to think about our own life in our own circumstances when we encounter similar situations. So we're going to be doing that tonight. We're going to be looking at a lot of examples, and um, we're going to be drawing principles from those examples. Okay? So with that, let's launch in. Turn with me, if you would, first to the book of Genesis, chapter 23. We'll look at one of the first Examples in the scripture of burial, the practice of burial. We're going to look at burial first because I think it's always good and healthy and wise to look at the the positive examples of, of what God teaches us about something. And then after that, we'll look at a list of, of, of examples of cremation because there are examples of both in scripture. And we'll see if we can draw the right conclusions from these. And then I've got a, a short list of a few verses that teach us more directly about these topics, but without necessarily putting it in the simplistic terms that I was describing earlier. Okay, so first we're going to look at a series of passages that address the issue of burial. And we're going to see from these passages what the Lord thinks about this from these examples. Now, this first one is somewhat long, but I'm going to read the whole section on purpose. It's all of Genesis chapter 23. It's the entire chapter. All of Genesis 23, the whole chapter, is a burial chapter. The Lord felt it was important enough to dedicate, in this one case, 
an entire chapter to just address this one issue. So it's worth our time to set aside to read this section. This is the death and burial of Sarah. And of course, Sarah was who? Anybody remember from the book of Genesis? Abraham's wife. She was the, the uh, if, if Abraham was the father of the covenant, Sarah was the, the mother of the covenant. Genesis 23, verse 1. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And Abraham rose up from before his dead. His dead there is Sarah. He rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land, and he said to them, If you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now, why, why is it that Abraham is offering money for this, this particular cave. The uh, Hittites were very gracious in this circumstance, in, in Abraham's moment of need, and they were essentially offering any part of their land and their own tombs to Abraham to use to bury his own dead. They were doing a very honorable thing, a very gracious, very generous thing. But Abraham didn't accept their offer of a gift of room in their tombs for his wife. Instead, he made a counteroffer. Instead of accepting their offer of a gift, he counteroffered to purchase the cave. The reason he wanted to purchase the cave is he wanted to make the cave his own property, to bury his own wife in his own property. It was an expression of honor for Sarah that he would not just borrow a burial spot for Sarah. It was an expression of great honor that he needed to purchase this land in order to provide a final resting place for her physical body. All right, so in uh, verse 10, let's read on. Now, Ephron was sitting among the Hittites, and Ephron the Hittite, he's the owner of the cave, answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites of all who went in, at the gate of his city. No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Now, Abraham's counteroffer is met with an even greater offer of graciousness and generosity on the part of Ephron. And then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, but if you will, hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me, that I may bury my dead there. And Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of the city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Okay, what's the first thing we learn? Well, one is it was important to Abraham to bury his wife. And two is in the, the burial process of his wife, it was important for him to own the land upon which 
and in which she was going to be laid to rest. Her physical body was going to be laid to rest. And so ownership of the land, even though it would cost him something, and it was offered to him for free, he rejected that free gift, rejected that offer. It was critically important on a spiritual level for him to express the value that he saw in his wife, Sarah, by purchasing this particular piece of property in which to bury her. All right, let's look at another example. I'm going to be picking up speed as we go through these. Genesis chapter 47, because I do want to get through all of these passages if I can tonight. This is, the, this is an example from the life of Jacob. Genesis 47, I'll read from verse 28. Genesis 47, 28. This is years later, generations later. Jacob is, of course, the grandson of Abraham. And 47, 28 says, And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, Israel is Jacob's other name, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh. That was a a specific, special, practical way that symbolized that I am, it was, it was, it was the most, uh, it was the most uh, serious way that one man could cause another man to make a promise that he would hold to no matter what. And the placing under the thigh, I won't get into detail about that other than to say, you don't want to break this promise. Okay? And so, when Jacob call, he knows he's about to die and he calls his son Joseph into his presence and he calls him into his presence and he said, now if I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head of his bed. Now, when Jacob is appealing to his son Joseph and and requiring a, a vow, a sacred promise to be made for his burial site, what we learn from this is, of course, like with Abraham, burial is apparently fairly significant. To Jacob. It's something important to him. But what's added to this particular equation that we don't see necessarily portrayed in the burial of Sarah in the earlier account is that Jacob wants to be buried not just anywhere, he wants to be buried somewhere specific. In this case, he was in Egypt and he was actually an honored person in Egypt, but he did not want to be buried in Egypt. Why do you suppose Jacob didn't want to be buried in Egypt? We have a hint of it in the passage here, but there's not a lot of extra detail given. Why didn't Jacob want to be buried in Egypt? Wanted to lie with his fathers. What he mean, meant, meant by that is he wanted to be buried in the same place that Abraham and Isaac had been buried. He wanted to share their burial place. And he asked his son to make a vow to please bury me there. And carry me there. And the carrying that, that he's describing here is not carry me on my sick bed there and then I'll die there and you can bury me there. The idea was he knew he was going to die. And after he was dead, he wouldn't have any say about where he would be buried. But he was appealing to his son, don't forget my wishes after I'm dead, after I'm gone. I'm asking you to be the responsible one and to carry out my last spiritual, spiritual wish, which is to be united with my father and my grandfather, the men of the covenant, in their burial place. And of course, did Joseph honor his father's request? The answer is yes, he did. Let's read on in Genesis 49. I'll read from Genesis 49, verse 28 to the end of the chapter. 
All these are the twelve tribes of Israel. This is what their father said to them as he blessed them, blessing each with the blessing suitable to him. This is at the very end now of Jacob's life. Then he communicated, or then he commanded them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people, meaning I'm going to die, burying me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. Now, Jacob identifies his burial place as the cave of Ephron the Hittite. That should be immediately familiar to us because we just made ourselves familiar with it. He wants to be buried in the exact same location that Sarah was buried in back in Genesis 23. And then later, though we didn't read this passage, Abraham was buried there and Isaac was buried there. His father and his grandfather and his grandmother. He wants to be buried in the exact same cave, exact same location. In the cave that is in the field at Machpelah, in the, to the east of Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field from Ephraim the Hittite to possess a burying place. Now, what, what, what we should learn from this is that Jacob has remembered the story of what his grandfather did to acquire this burial place. He's remembered the story, and he's remembered it in detail. This is something that he's been looking forward to. This is something he's been anticipating. This is something he's planned for, for a long period of time. And there, in verse 31, they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There, they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there, I buried, this is Jacob speaking, Leah. That's one of Jacob's two wives. The field and the cave that is in it were bought from the Hittites. And when Jacob finished commanding his sons, he drew up his feet into his bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Let's look at another passage in chapter 50, starting in verse 5. We're fast forwarding just a little bit in the story now. This is now Joseph speaking. Joseph is the son that's been made to vow to do this for his father. Verse 5. My father made me swear, saying, I am about to die in my tomb that I hew out for, my, hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall you bury me. Now, Joseph just gives us an additional piece of information about Jacob's involvement in this plan for a burial place. What's the additional piece of information that we haven't learned up until this point in the story? That it's not just that there's this cave that's sitting there, you know, in the, in the side of, the, of the, uh, the mountain in the field. And, you know, Jacob wants to be carried in there and buried there along with his, his father and his grandfather, mother and grandmother. But that Jacob has previously entered into this cave himself and personally, with his own hands, hewed out a place for his own burial. Now, what does that mean, hewed out? It's not a term we use too much anymore. It means he took, he took tools, probably, you know, a hammer and chisel, and in the, stone, in the stone walls of the cave, which was the common way that they did it in those days, he, he carved out a, uh, like a level place for his body to be laid, just like probably his father his grandfather, his mother and grandmother had each had a place carved out for them in this same cave. And he wanted to be taken to that cave and laid in the place that he himself carved out. Now, what is this telling us? It's telling us for Abraham, for Isaac, for Jacob, the fathers of the covenant, that this is not a minor issue. This is important. This is something significant to them. This is something that they have been personally involved in, personally looking forward to, personally planning, and actually working toward as a goal. So he says in verse 5, My father made me swear, saying, I'm about to die in my tomb that I hewed out for myself in the land of Canaan. There shall you bury me. Now, therefore, let me please go up and bury my father. This is now Joseph appealing to Pharaoh to release him to go bury his father. Then I will return. And Pharaoh answered, Go up and bury your father as he made you swear. So Joseph went up to bury his father. With him went all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, as well as all the household of Joseph, his brothers, and his father's household. 
Only their children, their flocks and their herds were left in the land of Goshen. And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen. It was a very great company. Now they did all of this. It's, I mean, this is, a, this is a train that was moving from the land of Egypt all the way north into the land of Canaan. And this whole train of people made this long, very difficult trip in those days when he could just easily have been buried in Egypt. Would have been much easier on everybody, much less costly, much, much less work involved, much less sacrifice, much less trouble involved. And yet he was willing to ask his son to make this kind of sacrifice. And his son was willing to make it. And all that served with his son in the government of Egypt, because by this time, of course, Joseph was in a position of great responsibility and authority over the entire land of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. The whole government, along with, along with Joseph, chose to go with him to honor this great man of God, Jacob, in fulfilling his last desire to be buried with his ancestors. And so they went up a great company, very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and grievous lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning on the threshing floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning by the Egyptians. Therefore, the place was called Abel Mizraim. It is beyond the Jordan. Thus his sons did for him as he had commanded them, for his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field at Machpelah to the east of Mamre, which Abraham bought with, bought with the field from Ephraim the Hittite to possess as a burying place. And after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Okay, what's the, the, the one spiritual principle that's behind all of this? The one spiritual principle that we see so far is the principle of honor. Honor is involved in the burial examples that we've seen so far. Let's look at another one. This one's a little bit different, but uh, it's worth mentioning. Uh, Fast forward to Deuteronomy chapter 34. This is the death of Moses that's described here. And I'm just picking out a few of the most important people in Scripture to see the principles that are displayed in their death and in their burial. There are many others that are described in Scripture that I just won't, we won't have time to address tonight. But Deuteronomy 34, we'll read starting in verse 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him. The he here is his assistant Joshua, who was with Moses at the time of his death. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And the children of Israel moved on from that place. All right, so Moses was buried by Joshua in a private burial ceremony known only to the Lord, to Moses, and to Joshua. Um, let's look at one more passage on an example of burial. This is, of course, the most famous burial in all of history, the most significant burial in all of history, the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Jesus, of course, was buried. And, you know, there was a time when looking at the burial of Jesus, I just looked at it kind of like from the standpoint of, well, of course, I mean, something had to be done. But um, later, when Paul talks about the essential elements of the gospel, he identifies that there are three most essential elements of the gospel account, the gospel story. We base our salvation on our faith in these three elements. He said those three elements are Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And the second element is that Christ was buried. And the third element is Christ rose from the dead. Now we 
tend to focus a lot of our attention, rightfully so, on the cross of Christ, and we focus a lot of attention, rightfully so, on the resurrection of Christ. But Paul considered the burial of Christ to be an essential element of the gospel. We'll read just the circumstances here without going into too much yet of the theological implications. But Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 33. But when they came to Jesus, these are the soldiers at the circumstances of his crucifixion. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth. This is John speaking of himself here that you also may believe. Remember, John was actually at the scene of the death of Jesus at the cross. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. As John there is, is addressing two of the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah's death and how they were fulfilled in the life of Christ. And after these things, verse 38 Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths, with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Why is the burial of Christ important? Why is it even mentioned within the bookends of the death on the cross and the resurrection from the dead as one of the core elements of the gospel. What's so important about the burial of Jesus and why, you know, why go to the trouble that they went to of wrapping the body in linen cloths and, and, and surrounding it with, with special spices and aloes, 75 pounds in weight of these special substances that were applied to the, to the freshly, the newly dead body of, of Jesus, why not just take his body down from the cross and build a fire and cremate him? Why not? It's truly not honoring him, but here's the thing. The Lord, and we know this, of course, this is the obvious point. The Lord had a plan for his body three days later. The reason not to cremate is because of an anticipation in faith of what the Lord was going to do with that same body in the future. And so the burial of the body is, has everything to do with a, a symbolic expression in faith of the anticipation of the coming resurrection of that same body. And so in a nutshell, the reason we bury is because we bury in faith. And we bury in faith and in anticipation, expectation of a future resurrection of the body. And we are honoring the person in the highest way that we possibly can by caring for their physical body and its final resting place and circumstance in a faithful anticipation of what awaits them in the future. It may not be three days later for them. It may be 300 years. It may be 3,000 years later. But it's the same issue that's at stake for each person that is buried. Now, I said we would look at some examples in Scripture of cremation. Let's do that. If burial, and it does, if burial equals a sim symbol of honor, and faith in, the, in a future resurrection, 
then cremation also symbolizes something. Whether we intend it to or not, it does symbolize something. And what it's a symbol of, it's a symbol of judgment. And as a result, is an expression of dishonor to burn the body of a person that has died. In every single case, without exception, in the scriptures, when a person's body is burned after they've died, it is an expression, a symbol of the judgment that they are under at the time of their death. Let's look at some examples of that. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 10. We won't read the first example. I'm just going to name the first example, and then I'll read you this one in Leviticus. The first and greatest example of cremation in Scripture, you might not have ordinarily thought of it in these terms, is the the famous story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The entire populations of Sodom and Gomorrah were cremated. They were cremated as fire from heaven fell upon those cities in the surrounding um, plain in which those cities were established. And everyone within those cities died instantly. And they died under the judgment of the Lord. Their bodies were never buried. Uh, This is another example of a cremation. This is uh, Leviticus chapter 10. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, these are priests of the Lord, under the leadership of their father, the high priest Aaron, each took his censer, which was a a container to hold uh, this special incense to offer as as sacrifice and worship before the Lord, but it was meant to be be done in a specific way as the Lord had commanded. And they put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. You know the story, but let's read on in verse 2. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said among those who are near me. I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Now Aaron was their father. You can imagine their father has just watched his two eldest sons die a horrible death in the presence of the Lord because as the priests of God, they've just violated the sanctity of the sanctuary of the Lord. They violated the holiness of the Lord and the Lord doesn't cut them in this case any slack because of their great responsibility and his clear instructions to them before this. And he hits both of these young men with a judgment of fire and consumes them. These men were cremated while this is the, 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 the uh, scary part of what happened to these men, the fearful part. They were cremated while alive, burned alive by the fire of God. And it says it came out from the presence of the Lord. What are we talking about? They entered into the tabernacle of the Lord And remember, there was the Ark of the Covenant, which was that special box that was built to symbolize or represent the throne of God. And the Lord and his presence would appear over that box and speak with Moses and interact with Moses. And so as they came into the tabernacle and violated the the holiness of the Lord and the holiness of the tabernacle, fire came forth from the presence of the Lord, from the Holy of Holies, and consumed them. All right, let's look at another example. Uh, Leviticus chapter 20. This is a law. This isn't so much, this passage isn't so much a, uh, a specific circumstance. It's a law that was established by the Lord for his people. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 14. This is an interesting law because we know that there are some laws that are so serious in the law of God that the Lord required what we call a death penalty. Meaning the punishment for certain most serious sins were to be dealt with with a death penalty. And most of the times when there was a death penalty, what was the normal method of death? 
stoning was the most common method in most cases. But let's read this one example in uh, Leviticus 20, single verse 14. If a man takes a woman and her mother also, it is depravity. He and they shall be burned with fire, that there may be no depravity among you. Now, I'm not going to go into details as to all of the, the, the implications of what's being described here in terms of the crime itself. I think most of you catch the drift of what's being described here. But what I want you to understand is that in this particular case, depravity of a very serious nature practiced in the lives of any of the children of Israel was to be met with a specific death penalty. And in this case, unlike most death penalty offenses which were to be handled with stoning, this one was to be handled with burning. So what we see is, in this case, cremation is another um, expression of judgment in action in the life of the person that receives this treatment. Okay, let's look at another one, one chapter over, chapter 21, verse 9. I know we're covering a lot of passages, but I want you to catch the flavor that this is a, a repeated theme that's woven throughout many portions of God's word. This one in Leviticus 21, 9 says, And the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by whoring, profanes her father, she shall be burned with fire. Again, this is another case where there's a death penalty to be applied, and it was a specific kind of death penalty. Serious judgment of the most serious kind. All right, let's look at another one. Uh, fast forward to the book of Joshua, chapter 7. Now the children of Israel are moving into the promised land. As they move into the promised land, they, in the second city that they encountered that the Lord had called them to conquer, they... Um, they experience their first defeat. And what they discover as they go back and seek the Lord after this defeat is that they were defeated because of a specific sinful compromise by one of the men of Israel and by his household, by his family. And that was the man Achan, who violated the Lord's very specific boundaries in the conquest of this city. All right, so Joshua chapter 7, we'll read verses 24 through 26. Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the cloak, and the bar of gold. These are the things that, that Achan had stolen for himself and had hidden away in his own tent. And his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and donkeys, and sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The point here is that Achan's sin had caused the Lord's judgment to fall upon the whole nation. The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. So stoning was the method of execution of the death penalty. But then they weren't done once he was stoned. Because once he's stoned, it's over. Right? You don't survive stoning in a, in a biblical sense. Once he was stoned, he's dead. He's gone. But as a symbol... This is what the Lord wanted them to do. All Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. And the, meaning they stoned them first and then burned their bodies. They cremated their bodies as an expression and symbol of the judgment of the Lord in which they died. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. The Lord didn't want them to forget this circumstance. And the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. All right. Um, I won't read, just for the sake of time, the next passage, 1 Samuel 31, 8 through 13, the death of Saul, the first king of Israel, and how he and his sons, who died in sin, died in rebellion against the Lord, were burned after their death. Let's do turn, though, to, um, let's do turn to the prophet Amos, chapter 2. Amos, toward the end of the Old Testament. And I'll read just the first two verses of Amos, chapter 2. 
This will be the last of our example passages of cremation. What I want you to see from these passages is that every one of these, every time a person's body is burned in, in Scripture, um, it's, it is an expression of judgment and dishonor. Amos chapter 2, verse 1, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab and for four I will not revoke the punishment, because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom. So I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the strongholds of Kerioth, and Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of the trumpet. The idea here is that one king had dishonored another king by burning his body when the first king that, was, that had his body burned didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve to die in this way. And the other king, just to dishonor him publicly, burned his body. And so now the Lord takes that as an offense against himself and sends a prophet to speak a word of judgment against the king of Moab who had offended the king, the memory of the king of, uh, in this case, Edom in this way and sends a judgment in like kind upon his life. You've burned this king's body, therefore I am going to burn you. All right, now let's look at some passages, and I'll move through these fairly quickly, that are not so much examples of either burial or, or cremation, but address the issue in terms of, of, of uh, identifying what we should think about these things. First Kings chapter 14. First Kings 14, I'll read from verse 7. This is from the life of Jeroboam. Go tell Jeroboam, this is the Lord's word to one of the prophets, Go tell Jeroboam, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because I exalted you among the people and made you leader over my people Israel, and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, and yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart, doing only what is right in my eyes. But you have done evil above all who were before you and have gone and made for yourself other gods and metal images, provoking me to anger and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring harm upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam every male, both bond and free in Israel, and will burn up the house of Jeroboam as a man burns up dung until it is all gone. Anyone belonging to Jeroboam who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens shall eat. For the Lord God has spoken it. Arise, therefore, and go to your house, and when your feet enter the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found something pleasing to the Lord, the God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. The Lord is pronouncing a, a judgment upon an entire household here. This is a rebellious king, Jeroboam, who had violated the ways of the Lord. And as the Lord pronounces a, a, a curse, essentially, a judgment upon his household, he makes one reservation, the Lord does. And he says, this is, this is what's going to happen to everyone in the household of Jeroboam. None of them are going to be buried. They're all going to die in judgment with one exception. I'll make sure this one person in the house of Jeroboam is actually buried, given what we would call a proper burial. Because this one person, they had, they had something in their heart that was valuable to me. They had a right heart toward me, and I'm going to remember them in their death, and I'm going to ensure that they receive a proper burial. It was the Lord's way of honoring that one exceptional person and dishonoring those that were to die in judgment. Okay, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 9. Second Kings chapter 9, reading from verse 6. This is from um, the days of the kings. So he arose and went into the house, and the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, 
Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. And you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond and free, in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. Right? The reason he opened the door and ran was because the people that he was delivering this message to weren't going to want to hear what he had to say. And he was afraid for his life. But the idea here is that this is a, a pronouncement of judgment upon the household of Ahab and his wife, Jezebel. And the specific judgment is she will never be buried. She was actually eaten by dogs. They only found certain portions of her body that were later buried. All right, let's look at another passage. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Ecclesiastes is, of course, right after Proverbs. Right in the middle of the Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Just read a single, just read a single verse here. Verse 3. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. The idea of a hundred children here and, and uh, the days of his years being many, the idea is you might have or what would ordinarily be considered a very long and rich and fulfilled life. But the preacher, as the writer of Ecclesiastes is identified in chapter 1, the preacher looks at this man's life and he evaluates, you could have a long and rich life, and if you are not buried at the end of your life, he compares it to a stillborn child, and he says that stillborn child would be better off than that person who lives this full life and comes to the end of his life and is not buried. The idea is, the spiritual principle behind this is, your life is ultimately valuable, not based upon what you say about your life, but what the Lord says about your life. And the burial of your physical body is the Lord's own expression of his blessing and his honor toward you for the way that you lived your life. And as a result of that, if we believe that the person that we're responsible to um, dispose of their physical body and provide their physical body a final resting place, if, we, if that's our responsibility and we believe the Lord would honor that person, then the appropriate and right way to express that, of course, is through burial. Now, there are several other passages I just won't have time to get to tonight. Uh, if you want some more references, feel free to see me about those. I'll be glad to get those to you. But let's look at one last passage, and we'll end with this one tonight. And this is, of course, in the Gospel of John, chapter 5, and this addresses this issue from the highest level spiritual perspective as we talked about earlier. This is from the teaching of the Lord Jesus. Gospel of John, chapter 5. I'll read from verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here 
when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. In that passage, when he refers to the dead, because he's going to refer to the dead twice in, in just a couple of passages here. In this first case, what he's referring to is those who we would identify as, from our study in Ephesians, those who are spiritually dead. This is a reference to what we call being born again. Those who are spiritually dead will hear his voice and will come alive as the Lord speaks the word of salvation to their hearts. But then there's another group of dead that are identified in this same section. He says in verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here, meaning the time of salvation has already arrived because Jesus had arrived. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming And this is an hour that's only in the future. The first hour is coming and already was. That's the the hour of salvation. The second hour now, he's referring to a future time, a future experience that had not already begun. And that is an anticipation of the final day of resurrection. He says, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There is an hour coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. And they'll come out to either a resurrection of life or resurrection leading to judgment. So why do we bury rather than cremate? We bury because in one sense, every day in which we live our lives is to be lived in anticipation of this final event. Our lives mean nothing outside of this final event. This is the culmination point of God's plan and purpose. And in the same sense, the last thing we do in our life is die. And what we do with our physical body as we die is and should be an an appropriate expression of the faith that we have in this final event in which we hope to be among those by the grace and mercy of God who are going to hear his voice on that final day and come out of the tombs unto a resurrection of life. Okay? So, what does the Bible teach about burial and cremation? It teaches that that burial is an honoring of those who have died, and it's an appropriate expression in the practicalities of the burial of our faith in a future resurrection of that physical body. And cremation, whether we intend it to express this or not, it is actually a symbolic expression of judgment that we should not want to show toward anyone that we love and anyone that we care about. So, uh, we'll end with that tonight. And uh, next Friday night, we will get back, Lord willing, to our study in Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll pick up where we left off. And uh, if you have other questions for future um, open studies, go ahead and get those questions to me. I will add that to our running list.